It's no secret that we are in an AI revolution. Investors, media pundits, and even some scientists are saying that AI is our ticket to a brighter future. That these large language models will accelerate medical research, they'll reverse disease, and dare I say it, the topic of this channel, curing hair loss. I am here to tell you that that is all wrong. At least right now. Because despite the hype, the glamour, the intrigue of AI, in my area of focus, hair loss research, I have only ever seen AI do one thing, hurt consumers. In reality, these AI models have a fundamental flaw. And until that flaw is fixed, they are going to be doing more harm than good. This is already true in the hair loss industry. And in this video, I am going to prove it to you. My name is Rob English. I am a researcher who specializes in hair loss disorders. I'm on the editorial board of a dermatology journal, and I'm the founder of perfecthairhealth.com, which is a center for education and consumer advocacy for all things hair. If you're fighting hair loss and feeling torn over where to start, what to do, you're feeling overwhelmed about your treatment choices, check out our free resources, our interactive guides, our articles. We offer a ton of support. Now, a tenet of our site is to get hair loss sufferers to prioritize education over product purchases. This is because the hair loss industry is filled with marketers who prefer to slant information so that they can get you to buy products that they're selling. I'll give you two examples. Dermatologists, they wanna sell you into PRP and stem cells, so they forget to mention at-home devices that you can purchase for 10 bucks that might be just as effective at regrowing hair. And then health websites will fear monger over the side effect of drugs so that they can sell you into their own supplement lines that are allegedly devoid of the same side effects. And so you get this really inefficient marketplace where consumers are never ever given the entire story about their treatments and what they need to be doing. And this inefficiency, it comes at a personal cost to people who take the wrong treatment path because they will end up wasting time, money, and hair. And so when hype around AI really began to start building in 2021, initially I was so excited. I saw a future where these large language models would act as vehicles for rapid information dissemination accurate information, that they could be tools that hair loss sufferers would use to fast track themselves to more accurate diagnoses, to save themselves from making bad product purchases, and any of the other countless mistakes that we tend to see people make on their journey to better hair. Three and a half years later, I can confidently say that I have predicted wrong. These large language models, they seem to now be co-opted by marketers selling products. And in the hair loss industry, they're hurting consumer purchasing decisions. It's due to a fundamental problem in how the models operate. And if we don't fix that problem, it's about to get a whole lot worse in the years to come. And to prove to you what I'm talking about and really illustrate this point, I will open with a story from just the other week. Recently, a member of our community asked a question. What is the best concentration for topical minoxidil? Now for background, topical minoxidil is an FDA approved drug to treat pattern hair loss. It's available over the counter in both two and 5% dilutions, but some telehealth brands will sell higher dilutions that you can get with a prescription. Now, lately I've been seeing online comments about how a 7.5 concentration of minoxidil is probably the best, which happens to be what that member in our site was using. But I started to wonder, you know, where are people getting this seven and a half percent number. Where's this information coming from? So I ran a Google search for something related to seven and a half percent minoxidil and lo and behold, Google's AI summary tool, Gemini, gave me the answers. It said that a 2022 study found that doses higher than 7.5% topical minoxidil might not produce better results, mainly because at dilutions higher than that amount, the minoxidil will crystallize, which would hinder its absorption into the scalp. So I read this and I thought, Oh, wow, that's kind of odd. First, I live and breathe hair loss research, and I know studies from almost 30 years ago showing that minoxidil can crystallize at concentrations as low as 2%. It all really depends on how the product is formulated. And I've also never heard of this 2022 study on 7.5% minoxidil, so at this point I'm thinking, clearly I am missing something. And this prompted me to go in and check Gemini's summary references. And lo and behold, there is a study. It's a literature review, which is basically a study summarizing other major studies on that topic. And it's from a report journal. It's also got some big names attached as authors. And when I searched the paper, I can clearly see exactly where Gemini pulled its information, which it accurately summarized. Okay, great. So this is all great news, but I'd still love to find this study about seven and a half percent minoxidil and this crystallization component, which I've apparently never heard of, despite the research being my full-time job. And there's more good news. The paper's section that Gemini summarized 
it also has a citation for it. So that's got to be the study they're referring to. So I click into the citation, I find the link to the 2022 study, I open it up and it, it's not a study at all. It's a website article. In other words, it's not a peer reviewed resource. This is a random article from the internet where anybody can write anything. And it's coming from a company that happens to also make money in part by affiliating with a business that sells high strength topical minoxidil. Let me just tell you that that citation in a peer reviewed study is incredibly weird to see. Normally you'd only ever cite peer reviewed papers from other reputable journals, not an internet article. But now I'm thinking, okay, maybe this internet article will finally tell me where to find the long fabled study on seven and a half percent minoxidil so that I can finally get to the bottom of this and stop feeling like a crazy person. So I search the article and I get to a chart that supports the study citation that seven and a half percent minoxidil is the best concentration. But I'm still wondering, you know, where is this data coming from? And so I research the article and lo and behold, there's nothing. There were no references to back up the data in that chart referenced in this study referenced by Google's Gemini, all from an internet article that's affiliating with minoxidil brands that sell higher strength minoxidil. I do, however, see a comment about minoxidil crystallization at seven and a half percent concentrations. And so there's a hyperlink and I get excited and I think, okay, well, if I click this link, then I will finally find the study supporting these claims and I can end this journey satisfied and with new information. And I click it and what do I find? It's a massive database called PubChem and it's all about minoxidil's chemistry. So I search for the terms 7%, 7.5%, 8%, crystal, propylene glycol, nothing. So then I think maybe the study is somehow buried in one of those collapsible tables. So I download the entire page and I display it as HTML and I run the same searches for the same terms. And guess what? Nothing absolutely nothing. Are you kidding me? We have hit the end of the rabbit hole and these claims made by this minoxidil affiliate cited by this literature review summarized by Google's AI Gemini cannot be substantiated. It is a statement made entirely from made up data. And yet this statement is now getting echoed into the internet, into Reddit, into online hair loss forums as fact. And as that statement gets repeated, it starts to influence consumer behavior and people start buying seven and a half percent minoxidil. After all, if you didn't just go through that entire exercise that I just did, why wouldn't you trust the information at face value? But the truth is you can't trust it. And that is the problem with AI. For all of the information filtering, synthesis, gatekeeping, AI cannot yet protect itself against its fundamental flaw, the data on which it operates, data which is inputted and provided not by computers, but by people, people with incentives, incentives like selling high strength minoxidil and enabling sales by creating a line of evidence that never exists. Now, this isn't to say that 7.5% minoxidil is bad or wrong or you shouldn't try it. Let me be clear, I'm not making a value judgment on that minoxidil concentration. We'll have later videos about what I think are appropriate doses for minoxidil. What I am judging, however, is the way in which this AI is arriving to the answer, which is not just inaccurate potentially, but also wrought with motivations to slant information toward a product sale which is exactly what I warned about earlier in this video. I think it was Charlie Munger who once said, show me the incentives and I will show you the outcomes. In the hair loss industry, the problem doesn't start and stop with questions about the best strength of minoxidil. That's just a fraction of what we're seeing. We're also seeing AI accurately summarize information from other well-ranking authority websites that ironically also miscite or make up results from studies to slant you toward those products that they're trying to sell. Just search hair growth for copper peptides or reishi mushroom or biotin. You will see Gemini summarize articles accurately that promote the use of these ingredients for treating hair loss, only to later realize through the same exercise we just did that the positions that those articles take on those ingredients are favorable because they're selling you those ingredients. The problem with AI is its data. And the problem with its data is people. Marketers have already figured this out. They are buying product placements on high ranking websites because those sites are going to be used in AI algorithms if they're not already. And now they're also buying fake reviews at scale. When Google inked a deal with Reddit to feed its user data into AI, 
It took a matter of hours before marketers started exploding subreddits with anonymous positive reviews for whatever brand they were promoting and negative reviews of their competitors, knowing that that data will one day get filtered back into the AI algorithms, which will only benefit their own product sales. With enough effort, marketers know they can probably get these AI tools to say almost anything that they want about what they're selling. And this isn't just a problem for hair loss, it is a problem for health and medical research overall. And that's scary, and we need guardrails in place to protect consumers so that we can make this stop and make sure that they are making well-educated and thoughtful decisions about what products they're buying. So what do we do about this? Unfortunately, I don't see a simple answer, but I do think that there is hope. For starters, we should probably retrain AI models so that they stop pulling single quote information from a single citation that they think is high authority. Instead, they might want to identify five or six sources that reference the same exact paper or citation that they're referring to, and then see how those sources' interpretations of that paper differ, and then map those differences with analytics to display any conflicts of interest, such as selling something based on information in the article. Then you could create a sentiment score of the interpretations and go from there. While you could still hack that system, it's gonna be a whole lot harder than how easy it is right now. And I think that these sentiment scores for bias at least are going to clue into consumers the fact that, hey, whatever this AI is telling you to get or whatever this AI is telling you is right, the data that it might be basing that decision on could be brought with some bias or inaccurate information. So if you're using AI, stay vigilant, be aware of this. There will be a day where these models run with better precision and that they'll be adopted and be incredible for everybody. That day is not right now. That's not to say that AI won't change our future, in many ways, it already has. But as a consumer research tool, it needs better safeguards because right now, I'm only seeing AI becoming weaponized against the interests of consumers in the hair loss space and probably a whole lot of others as well. Again, show me the incentives and I will show you the outcomes. Thanks for watching. I hope this video helps show you how these algorithms are working, what to look out for, how to stay a step ahead of the situation when you're shopping for hair care products. We will be back soon. Take care and we'll see you next time.